side seats compensate. Nothing new to be said about a job completed for you by others in windowless rooms. A half-soul in transit, the man you were for one short season has been pruned, removed to a well-groomed graveyard that smells like popcorn.
thought of chimes filters in from next door. I am under the echo, not listening so much as noticing it from time to time as I look over the results of my landscaping and weeding from a white wicker chair. An errant vine has sprouted two blue flowers where it reaches the base of the lemon tree. They are beautiful. I am suspicious. Are they a diversion, an entreaty to keep me from cutting back the vine? I'll keep the flowers and put them in a saucer by your bed. He writes startled fish, not pimply virgin, describes creamy cotton bodice, not dirty white jeans, says down to the river, not up my ass, calls it tree of blood, not something else that wasn't Adam or Eve or a neuter moon, camouflage, not lying, art of confession, confession of art. And when, from time to time, he allows himself, I spit in your face, somehow that also stumbles true. Romano, marciano, espada de bronce, mirada de marfil, lengua floja, boca verde, nuca peluda, sesos envenenados de plomo. Eleonora, listen to the way she chews her food, the force of her devouring, healthy teeth, horse jaw elegance. She looks up as she swallows, caught by the unwavering accusation in our sharp young eyes. I remember riding behind her through the stirrup high razor grass around giant anthills as battalions of mosquitoes hovered over the switching tail of her irritated mare. Is she in Chicago? Did she remarry? Is her hair gray? Does she still read French novels? Is she still tall and skinny? Does she still ride? Was she in love with my father? Was he in love with her? Hacking trail for us, he leads the way through thickets of soaking green monkey brush, calling out animal hideaways and bringing home pieces of crude botanical conjecture with lazy hacks of his vine-stained machete.
Parker. Down in the dirt, the children played safely in the shadow of a noose, while the aging judge prayed for a vision in the morning coolness of his naked wooden chambers. They played shoot 'em ups and ran shrieking in the sun, hiding in the cottonwoods, out of breath and pretending to load guns. His face was scarred with the anguish and hatred of injured parties. He saw with no one's eyes all the living, all the dead. There was no joy in his work, no satisfaction from his efforts, only consequences. The night was of twirling in consequence to them, pretty much a waste of time. No amount of drinking or small talk could alleviate the overwhelming boredom induced by a seemingly endless parade of amateur acrobatic displays. Sensing this, the performers took more risks, attempting stunts that had not been perfected. This only served to irritate the audience as it further prolonged the evening with insufferable drum rolls and false starts. When a boy fell off the high wire motorcycle into the shark pond and was instantly torn apart, it elicited no more than a murmur of distracted interest. Once the last piece of him had disappeared under the bloodied lily pads, they were back to nursing their iced thermoses, quibbling bitterly as they checked their watches and called up their phone machines. I first heard your voice from an airplane. You told me you had crystal knees and couldn't stop thinking about Gene Seberg's fetus baby in its glass coffin to prove it wasn't black at all. I wanted to hang up or politely say goodbye and then change my number and never answer the phone again until I knew you were dead. But you kept saying things I wanted to hear, like that a window might as well be a wall, but thank God for fish tanks and bottles.
Pasión clave pero fugaz, tarde nublada, brisa cálida, granitos de olvido en tus pestañas. Te veo, te llamo, pienso que hablo en voz alta, me traga el tráfico, me alegro. Voy medio mojado, casi limpio, no pido ni tengo que dar el perdón. Outside, foreplay of rain clouds. Inside, you write in your diary, probably about the argument we've been having on and off all morning. Little hand never stops, nothing omitted, everything rewritten. Shared past becomes rope, stretches necks. We don't fight, we don't lose. Short hands present you, I am exposed. It isn't personal, you say. It's defense, I say. I'll put on my clothes. The whole room or whatever. Um, maybe? Do you have a cable to plug in? Oh, I forgot. <laughs>
They wound up into the hills knowing only that they were climbing away from the city's main drags, past the stacks of well-tended and unattended residences, investments for some and just homes for others, irrigated, orderly, protected. Steep driveways twisting back darkly from jungled gateways, forbidding entrances hinting at mysterious fruits of mysterious labors. Not a dog or pedestrian to be seen, only confident headlights whipping into view out of the tropical night. With each startling turn of the pinched road, they'd smell a different kind of flower. They couldn't stop grinning at their good fortune. These were the homes of movie stars, of illicit meetings, intoxicated palm gardens, unknown phone numbers, the breeding grounds of fame. Suddenly, they were out in the open again on a deserted bend of Mulholland where they hung high above the fireworked valley. 
This was better than the view yesterday from the Griffith Observatory. Or maybe just as good, only different. They had driven up and down the phone pole filthiness of Santa Monica Boulevard and found it uplifting. They had swum in the Pacific Ocean. They had walked Hollywood Boulevard, in and out of movie theaters just to look at the posters. Reverent as they examined the James Dean stores. Wildly exuberant through humped up Saturday night traffic. It was all part of a wonderful secret. An infinite number of welcoming gifts that had lain waiting in the sun. Down there, the sun. Weekends, weekends, weekends. Medicated limbs Medicated are lonely, lonely and greedy, greedy, and greedy. Sick, for sick for attention, dying for company, dying for company. you're drunk for days. For days. Overburdened, Overburdened moss-rotten moss branches, branches heave slowly with the weak night breeze, like a failing heart, and graze the stone wall. The nurse and me won't let me leave. Homemade illness hardens into sugar and batters your speech, draping your dry white tongue over your teeth. Red pinholes for eyes, and your mouth is a smudge. Do I have to watch tomorrow afternoon while you keep your face warm with the television and the maple drips on the lawn chairs that flake and rust on the flooded terrace? When you start snoring, I'll take the tray from your lap and tip you over so I can look for the rest of your lunch under the green sofa cushions and probably end up finding those pills you've been hiding. By the time the clouds dim and I start to see us in the windows, I'll be drunk myself and ready to wake you for dinner. By the time the clouds dim and I start to see us in the windows, I'll be drunk myself. Pasan las nubes sin que me anime a saltar Estudio mis manos en vez de tus ojos La lluvia cantó en la chapa Los sueños de la tarde de ayer Cada gota frenada por el techo de la cocina Cuando yo dormía con el gato en la falda Pieces of you drift by in the dead of the afternoon On the yellow tip of a wave The same shark that came to shore at the end of yesterday rolls sickly, bumping coral like a tired drunk to avoid being eaten at low tide. He's not afraid of me. I'm thinking of you, so much gone from memory that I'm left with just your teeth. After years of merging and allowing yourself to be assimilated, Your hair and clothes had turned brown. Then, one afternoon, you exit a theater after taking in the restored version of The Hero Returns and find yourself wanting to be treated special.
vil jeg lytte til den rigtige sang, dukker op i en trope, der løber over vingen og hænger fra dørgrebet. Synger sammen gennem byen, presser en tog, som bor i dit håndtryk. She gets an ear infection during the holidays and starts listening carefully to everything in case she can't hear anything tomorrow. This passes, and she is not startled when the phone rings at 7 in the morning one day. Uh, this one's called Prepare, maybe. Kneeling over the narrow rails, the actor studies the steel using all of his senses, seeming to seek some flaw, some hint, clue, incongruity hidden to those less observant. Perhaps he has a sound method for pinpointing nearness of locomotives, coming or gone, as yet impossible save for the most sensitive instruments to discern. He breathes on the rail, wipes it with his palm, leans in, nose close, and turns his head slowly side to side.
feeling the world was going to blow. The feeling was not any stronger than other times when he'd anticipated something. Something like the phone ringing, an earthquake, or a knock on the door. Then the world blew. Thank you.